In this video, I'll be talking to you about Eliza Haywood and her novel, The Rash Resolve. If we can call it a novel, it's short, so we could say a novella. Anyway, Haywood ha published over 70 works during her lifetime. She wrote fiction, poetry, drama, conduct literature, um, and she also wrote a journal. Uh, called The Female Spectator, which was kind of like the famous Addison and Steele Spectator only for, for women. She was also an actress on the stage, and she was a professional writer like Afro Ben, in that she made her living entirely from her writing. And we don't know that much about her life. There is a political biography of her by Catherine King, and um, there's information there about her political affiliation and her friendship circle, but we don't know a whole lot about, about her life. We do know about her novels, and her novels were not really read in universities for until maybe about 15 years ago. So she was very popular in the 18th century. She was a popular fiction writer and also a playwright, and she was pretty well known. She was famously kind of looked down on by some of the more um, canonical writers that we know about now, like Alexander Pope made fun of her as a, as a hack writer, and he has a line about how she had a couple of illegitimate children, which, you know, probably isn't true. But anyway, she, she was she was mocked by some some writers, but that does actually speak to her visibility and also her and also her success. So her most popular novel was one called Love in Excess, and that's available in, I believe, a Broadview edition. And that's the one that gets taught the most because it's been available in this in this edition. But and and I believe it was the most popular in her lifetime, Love in Excess, that kind of kicked her into, into fame. She had a very long career. The other novel that people read in classes these days is called Betsy Thoughtless, which is, um, which was one of her later works of fiction and really has more of a feel of what we generally think of as a novel. But for reasons that I hope to make clear in this video, I really like The Rash Resolve, and I was so happy that somebody actually finally did an edition of this one because I think it's a really wonderful, wonderful narrative, and it's a little different from other things that you'll see in, in this period, although maybe there's more things like this out there. So it's obvious that Haywood is very interested in emotions, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. and. Her characters are individuals, but they're not necessarily fully in control of themselves. So she's very interested in their emotions. And we might even say, we might even say passions sounds more specific to Haywood. She was famously once labeled the great arbitress of passions, which you could take as being somebody who's very interested in writing about passion, which is certainly true, but you also want to look at that word arbitress, which means that she thought about passion and thought about uh, how to balance and arbitrate those passions. And I would also remind you that a lot of times when 21st century people hear the word passion, they immediately think of sexual desire. But as we know, of course, from Descartes, passions are another are the word that they use for emotions. And again, you know, some people think that it's the same thing. Other people would, would say that passions are very different from emotions. But I guess the main thing I want to emphasize here is that passion is not the same thing as sexual passion. So she's looking at a wider range of human experience. Although in her narrative, often these experiences are prompted by some sort of um, sexual relationship or sexual desire. But really she's interested in exploring the whole range of things that are a consequence and go along with it. It isn't simply, are you in control or are you not in control? I think that's not really a Haywood question. I mean, of course you're not in control. That would 
be her argument. So in that sense, she's more like Descartes than Hobbes, where she sees um, emotions, passions as something that just take over your body and aren't necessarily filtered through a cognitive process especially immediately and you just uh, you just respond to them um so her characters are often over overwhelmed by by passions and not just the passion of passionate love but other kinds of passions as well so so okay so let's think about that in terms of the rash resolve which starts out in the spanish colony of Puerto Rico. So it's um so our heroine, Emanuela, is raised in Puerto Rico, and so she's isolated from the mainland of of Spain. So I think those those extremes of emotion that you see in Haywood at this point should be a little bit familiar because we also saw them in Afroban. And I think Haywood has um like Afro Ben, she has some Cartesianism and she has some Hobbesian experience of emotion. So if you'll notice, I think in Afro Ben, the place where you see the most Cartesian influence is when she's writing about Africa. And in, in Orinoco, in the passages in Africa and in the character Orinoco, the emotions tend to be very physical and vis visceral and the characters aren't fully in control of them. So for example, um, when, Imo, when Orinoco thinks he's lost Imoinda when he's in Africa, he just, he can't fight anymore. He goes into this great depression and he's only brought out of it by the friendship of, of Jamoan. And then later in Suriname, when he kills her, he, that's just it for him. He just can't, he can't move. He can't leave that spot. He's lost all of his will to do anything else so he can't there, he can't reason himself out of those thoughts it's just he's just overwhelmed by them it's a physical experience as it is in um in descartes although there are hobbesian characters in orinoco and one of them might be the ship's captain who's very strategic about how he's going to draw Orinoco onto the ship. And then when Orinoco is going to kill himself, he comes up with a scheme too to persuade him not to kill himself. So yeah, you might say in Orinoco, the English characters are rather Hobbesian for the most part, and the African characters are Cartesian. And so, uh, although there's some, you know, there's some um wiggle room there but i think that's overall uh the native Sur surinamese are are weirdly hobbesian and that they compete with each other for status by how much pain they can endure so they're they're extreme hobbesians which to return to the rash resolve so romantic love is definitely part of emmanuel's story but it's only a small small part of it and it tends to be the problem rather than the solution in this novel. So Emanuela is tormented by Don Pedro and haunted by Don Marcos. And most of her experiences of romantic love lead to lead to negative things, lead to something, something bad. So, so romantic love, even when she's in Spain, though, isn't really what gets her into trouble or what leads to her um, bad experiences, it's really Borrelia's envy, which is only grounded in the fact that um, that Emanuela is more beautiful and very kind and so she's more popular and she has uh, some independent wealth. And so Borrelia is just envious of her and sets her up in a trap. And Emanuela is naive. And part of her naivety comes from having been raised in Puerto Rico rather than Spain. So the implication is that she was kind of outside of the normal social refinements or normal kind of um, social context that you would find in Spain. And so she just, she just can't see that 
Brulia is not her friend and not looking out for her. So if she has a flaw, that's it. I mean, Haywood herself says that Emmanuel's flaw is self-will and that she's highly virtuous in everything else except for she has too much self-will. But I think we could also see that, I mean, this isn't really a moral flaw, but that she is not a good reader of other people all the time, especially of, especially of Borrelia. When she is in Puerto Rico, we don't really get any sense of the, the island, but we do see that she's incredibly vulnerable to Don, Don Pedro's power. And the implication is that because it's a colony, that the King of Spain doesn't have as much authority over it because just because of the distance. And so Don Pedro can kind of do anything he wants and he holds her prisoner and she's only only liberated by the love of Don Marcos, who doesn't really expect her love in return and um, and actually, you know, dramatically uh, kills himself to demonstrate to demonstrate her virtue. And it's actually successful. I've always wondered about the title of the rash resolve, like which is the rash resolve? She, she takes a few resolves that we might consider rash. Um, was it was it a rash resolve to refuse the marriage of Don Don Marco in the first place? I don't know. She didn't love him, but that might have made sense for her at that time. Um, was it a, re, a rash resolve to escape from the convent when she discovered that she's pregnant? Perhaps this would have been her most rash resolve because she she is she's pregnant and she just you know leaves. I mean, her entering the con convent is not an entirely rash resolve in the sense that, at least in novels of the time, women who are disappointed in love do end up often in convents. Convents are ambiguous spaces. Sometimes they're described as a punishment, but other times they're described as a refuge and a place where women can live out their lives in happiness and friendship. With, with each other away from away from men. It depends on the novel. But I think leaving the convent is quite the rash resolve because she um, goes you know out into the elements with no plan and no protection. I think her declining marriage to Amelius mm, might be a rash resolve. And it might involve a little pride because he possibly would have accepted her without her wealth that is lost at sea, as you recall. But she resolves that at this point she's not good enough for him. And then, you know, and she believes the rumors that she hears from Borrelia. So she's just out there. She leaves the convent and she's out there. And I think this makes this novel if you can call the novel, this novella kind of unusual in the 18th century because, um, because she starts out at this rather elite position. She loses her money, but she doesn't really lose her status until she leaves the convent and gives up her identity completely. And there's this scene in the middle where she's just out in the rain and she's just a body. She could be anyone and she's pregnant and she's vulnerable and somebody is kind to her and she you know has some money so she's able to get clothes and she's able to survive but really um she's sort of stripped of all of her status and has to live out there by her wits and so she gets a job she gives birth to her son and she's just feels this whole new kind of emotion, which is eternal, maternal love. And in order to support her son, she she gets a job. And this is like a fairly unusual thing. And I think from the novels that I've read anyway, but her love for Victorinus is really one of the central passions, I think, of the, of the novel. So, she is motivated by the desire to protect him and to take care of him. And then, of course, she re-encounters Amelius at the end and she is recognized and 
at the end, she's just simply so overwhelmed by emotion that, that it kills her. And this is sort of a Cartesian experience of just having so much emotion just flood all over her body. And uh, it's really, it's, it's sad and it's poignant, although there, there is a sort of um, way, in, uh, something of a redemption in that Victorinus becomes the heir of both the mother and the father and is, becomes a, a fine gentleman who they would have been proud of. But her, her passion is, um, is to take care of this son. And um, Borrelia's, on the other hand, is, is envy and lust and desire. And she tricks Amelia, uh, Emanuela, several times and takes her money and um, puts herself also in a very dangerous position, which is leaves with a man with a lot of money. And so she's not, she's not so lucky. So The Rash Resolve is, I think, um, a really interesting novel from the point of view of 18th century feminism. It's a, a story of a woman who really decides to work to support her child. She's actually um, emotionally refreshed by this child and she doesn't really pine for for the for the father of the child. She's just happy happy to be in in his vicinity. A few more points about the rash resolve. First of all, another candidate for her rashness might be having had sex with Emilius in the first place when she's not married to him. But I don't really think that's a rash resolve. And it's because they've, they're contracted to marry each other and they're fully committed to each other. And at the time, that was considered to give people permission to have sex. So it was not the case that you had to be officially married in a church with a contract for it to be moral to, to have sex. So in her mind, and I also think in the mind of Amelius, they, they would not really consider that extramarital sex, that because they've made this commitment to each other and then the marriage has a, um, you know, a formal, legal, technical quality. But she's also independent because she, her father's dead and her fortune is in her own hands. So it's not, it's not really rash for her to do that, especially because they've, they've committed to being married. It's the fact that the trouble comes when she finds out her, her money hasn't come in and she decides it wouldn't be right to marry him. That's po more possibly something that's that's rash. So, so that is one thing that is um, probably not the rash resolve. In general, the novel is often described as the genre that shows the emergence of individualism in the 18th century. We'll see this more clearly in Robinson Crusoe, which is about an, it very much about an individual all alone. You might think of the story of Emanuela also as a kind of individualism. But what's important to notice here, and I think in other novels about individualism too, is that individualism is really the worst possible situation you can find yourself in. When she leaves the convent pregnant, she has absolutely nobody. She is completely desolate. It's only through these family ties that people are able to survive. And this isn't just women, although perhaps it's more pronounced in the case of women. It's true, it's true for men as well. But her individualism is part of her flaw actually because as Haywood herself said she her only vulnerability is self-will 
And if she had been more open with Amelius, if she had gone to her uncle and told him the situation, there probably would have been ways to solve it that would not have put her in such a vulnerable situation. But she's very self-willed and she, of course, also trusts the wrong person, which is um, Borrelia. And because she doesn't lie herself, it doesn't occur to her that anyone else is lying. So that's another important social skill to have is to be able to figure out what's going on in other people's heads, which is not something that she really seems all that good at and to her, to her detriment. There's a, a little bit to say, I think, about Haywood's politics and what the convent means. I know I mentioned that earlier, but I just want to return briefly to it to also mention that that she rescues Borrelia from the convent. And I think that doesn't actually mean that Haywood or any of the characters are opposed to convents. It's just that it's not something at all that Borrelia wants to do. She wants to be married. And so, so she's um, happy to have to have her friend pay money for her so that she doesn't have to go to a convent. But sometimes, but I don't want you to think that convents are always a bad thing in Haywood because sometimes they're, sometimes they're places of refuge and the convent where she goes to is not really a bad thing. The only reason why it becomes uncomfortable for her is because she's pregnant and she doesn't feel like she can tell anybody that she just, she just escapes. So, so finally, there's something really tragic about this novel, I think, in the kind of classic tragic sense, in that characters are making decisions without having full knowledge, especially our, our heroine, Emanuela, who really gets in trouble through no fault of her own. And what's also interesting is that in the love triangle, the, neither of the other two characters are really at fault either because Amelius thinks that she has abandoned him and um, Amelius's wife has no way of, of knowing any of this. So it's all this, all this innocence that leads to an unhappy situation that makes something, that makes something a tragedy rather than something where you can point to a moral flaw.